Now, the thing to understand with China is that unlike most other countries in the world, it's not really a country, it's kind of more of a civilization, right? So the word China, like, as said by the Chinese, is a Zhao Gong, is, is, sorry, Zhong Gao, uh, I think I'm bad with pronunciation, but that basically means the Middle Kingdom, right? So actually, I hope I didn't say anything rude the first time I said it in China, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so you know, it means Middle Kingdom, right? So this is basically you know, the Middle Kingdom between heaven and the rest of earth, right? So this kind of gives you an idea of how the Chinese view themselves, right? And especially how they viewed uh, their emperor, uh, like at the time when they had uh, empires, right? We're not going to talk about all the other dynasties and stuff yet, like we'll mention them if they're relevant to this video, but like there's a lot of dynasties, right? But what you have to understand is that, you know, from the very first dynasty, uh, the Zhao dynasty, um, they basically came up with the idea of the mandate for heaven, right? So the mandate of heaven is basically this idea, which is very much of a, a Confucianist idea. So when Confucianism, you have like, an ordered society and stuff yeah so you know the son and the father like you know the, the emperor and his people right so in that regard that's kind of the base the way to kind of think about it right so if you have the mandate for heaven that means that like heaven itself has ordained that you have the divine right to rule uh, the empire right however if something happens that's like bad like if even if it's something that's completely out of your control like a natural disaster or something yeah if enough of those kind of happen then the people have every right to basically rise up against the dynasty that's ruling, yeah, whatever like ruling regime it is, right? So that's kind of something to kind of bear in mind, yeah, that like this, you don't really see these kind of checks and balances in other countries, right? You don't see it in other civilizations. Okay, we're in our democratic system, you know, if you don't like people, you vote them out of office, right? But like there's never this idea of like, you know, someone who's supposed to be this absolute monarch can be overthrown by the people and a new dynasty be set up in its place if they're not doing the right thing, right? Which is, it's good in a way because of level of accountability, but it's also quite an interesting kind of way of looking at things, right? The next dynasty after the Zhao was the Jin uh, dynasty, right? So this is where we get the word uh, China from, so like the Qin. So this is the first dynasty that comes up with kind of what one could uh, refer to as Chinese legalism, right? So uh, if you have legalism, it's basically this idea of a kind of uh, bureaucratic state, basically, yeah? So whereas in many other countries around the world at this time, uh, the, base, the way to like rise up and stuff, yeah, was, you know, to win in war or whatever, or to uh, curry favour with like the emperor or the king or whatever, and basically then you become a knight and become a member of the nobility. In China, it was very much a meritocratic system, right? So the centralized state, right, which is far more centralized than most other civilizations around the world and stuff, right? The way to rise up there was by being competent, was by passing examinations, yeah, so it proved that you were smart and like, et cetera. And that was kind of the way to kind of like move up and stuff, right? And also you start to see, you know, so the first uh, uh, like emperor of China as such, like uh, we kind of think of, uh, he's the one who like had the famous uh, terracotta army and stuff. And he also is the one who began to uh, build the Great War of China, right? So from very, very early on, if you think about it, like imagine having the Roman Empire still exist today, yeah, with the exact same kind of culture. That's basically the way to think of China, yeah. It's like this continuation through thousands and thousands of years of uh, history, right? Right, fast forward in now about like a thousand years, there's many different dynasties, uh, you know, they all keep kind of changing and stuff, etc, etc. Uh, some of them are more uh, based up in the north, some of them are more based down in the south. So, you know, China's geography, it, the way to think about it is that like in the north of China, you have uh, the same kind of temperature, the same kind of climate as you would in, in Europe. Uh, whereas in the south, it tends to be more tropical, you have more rice farms, etc, etc. So, you know, if left to its own devices, yeah, China will end up kind of being split along these kind of lines. And on top of that as well, China is obviously huge. It's about like the same size of like Europe or America. And obviously it has so many, like many, many more people uh, than, than either of them. So, you know, so like each of the different provinces, if left to their own devices, can basically become like little like uh, competing kingdoms. So whenever you end up having a dynasty that collapses, what ends up happening is that you end up having a, a period of like the warring states. Uh, so basically there ends up being a vie for power for who's gonna take control over all of China. Anyway, fast forward from this, you end up having uh, the Mongols invading. And when the Mongols invaded, as we discussed in our uh, previous video on uh, what the Mongols invaded uh, Japan, what you end up seeing is that any society that ends up being invaded by foreigners, especially foreigners as brutal as the, uh, uh, the Mongols, right? You know, because obviously tens of millions of Chinese people end up being massacred and stuff, right? So what ends up happening is that they end up becoming inward looking, right? They become insular and they end up becoming incredibly xenophobic. 
So the dynasty that takes on after the, uh, the Yuan dynasty ends up being the Ming dynasty, right? And apart from a few kind of explorers, so for instance, you had uh, Zheng He, and like, yo, uh, so he was an explorer, had a massive navy and it sailed to India and it sailed all the way to like uh, the East Coast of Africa and stuff. So, you know, so in spite of people like him, the reaction of the Ming dynasty was like, no, we don't really... Yeah, we don't want foreigners. We don't actually need foreigners. Um, and like, so the whole rest of the world, basically, we're not bothered by them. And also as well, something to understand is that uh, the Chinese, the very first country which they ever recognized was Russia in 1860. Now we're going to get onto that a little bit later, but this kind of gives you an idea of how the Chinese have always viewed foreign policy, right? So the idea of like basically um, each uh, kind of neighboring state or just foreigners in general, right? They're made up of barbarians and they are all tributaries to the Middle Kingdom, right? You know, so whether you have a Korean or Japanese or Vietnamese or whatever it is, right? When they come to China, they are paying tribute to the emperor, right? And so that's kind of the way to view it, right? They're not on equal terms, yeah? You're not in, on equal terms with the Middle Kingdom, right? You are inferior, right? And it's a privilege for you. Like, if you decide to come, it's a privilege for you to even, like, be allowed to, like, talk to, like, uh, the, the emperor or stuff, right? So... This is how the Chinese basically viewed foreign policy, that they are the very centre of the world, that other people come to them for things like silk and tea, etc, etc, but that they don't need other things, right? They don't need the rest of the world. So fast forward now to like the modern age, you can kind of see like this, uh, this uh, mentality clashing with basically the modern like kind of like European world. So the next dynasty that takes over after the Ming is the Jing uh, dynasty, right? And they rule from 1644 up until uh, 1912. And, you know, uh, just like the Mongols before, you know, this dynasty came from outsiders, right? So this is the Manchus, who like today live in more, uh, northern China, but they are not the same as like the, the majority uh, Han people. You know, so they end up uh, taking over. But what is happening is much the same way as we had with the Mongols, right? The Chinese, you know, they are basically, there's so many of them, that any rules that end up taking over end up becoming sinicized, right? So within a few generations, they basically end up becoming Chinese, right? They use the same bureaucracy, they use the same tax system, they have the same culture, speak the same language, et cetera, et cetera, as the native Chinese. So for all intents and purposes, they end up taking over the same mindset as the Ming dynasty had beforehand and nearly every other dynasty that, that, that preceded them, right? They end up basically seeing the whole rest of the world as barbarians and they are the, the most important people in the whole world. So in the 1790s, uh, China was at its absolute zenith. You know, its population was about a third of the entire world and it was either the number one or the number two uh, largest uh, economy in the whole world at this time. So absolute massive. So it really does earn its uh, name as like kind of the, the middle kingdom, right? So what one would expect is that like the other uh, powers around the world would also still continue to recognise that, right? No, because the British at this time uh, they already had the empire on which the sun never set, right? And that phrase was coined by Earl George McCartney, right? So Earl George McCartney, uh, he was an emissary who was sent by King George III. Yes, that King George, uh, the same one who's in Hamilton. So anyway, he was sent uh, uh, by King George III. So England at this time was the largest uh, empire, right? And it was the most powerful country in like the whole world. You know, like kind of it had control over like, you know, all the seas right and at that time britain really did rule the waves and so one would expect that now that the tide of uh, uh, geopolitical like balance has been turned that the chinese would kind of understand that and kind of be like okay these westerners are far far in advance of where we are uh, their technology is far superior etc etc let's humble ourselves and actually recognize what's kind of going on here right no, that didn't happen. <laughs> Instead, in 1792 to 1793, uh, L. McCartney, uh, he went to uh, visit the emperor, right? And he had all these trinkets, all these kind of you know, telescopes and all these kind of things, uh, which are products of the, uh, uh, the Age of Enlightenment and like kind of the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution. So he thought that like, right, showing these to the emperor, the emperor is going to see this and go, wow, look at all these things that these uh, clever like, Westerners have and stuff, right? So clearly, there's stuff that we can buy off of them, yeah, like all these clocks and everything, yeah. And, you know, also we have to humble ourselves and recognise that the British are now kind of uh, far ahead of us, right? However, this didn't happen. And it goes back to what we said before about the, the Chinese and their tributary system, right? So basically the Chinese emperor's response was, okay, thank you for 
making the, the effort. Um, thank you for coming all this way. Don't really know where your country is, don't really care. Um, these tributes are really nice, um, but we don't really need them. And actually, I'll read a quote from you. This came straight from the Emperor Quin Quinlong. P p apology if I mispronounced the name, right? So this is the quote from him. Our celestial empire possesses all things in a prolific abundance and lacks no product within its borders. There is therefore no need to import the manufacturers of outside barbarians in exchange for our own produce. So that's not a very nice way to, to like, respond to your guests, right? Uh, first of all, calling them barbarians, mm, probably not the best idea. And second of all, this kind of this arrogance of basically being like, okay, we have everything in the whole world, why do we need to trade with you? At no point, we, you know, we don't need any of your things yet, right? There might be more technical, whatever. These are just trinkets, right? We don't actually care, right? So the British were not very pleased with this, right? And on top of that, there was another thing. Uh, so we in England uh, have like the, the, the word kowtow, and it comes as a result of what ended up happening next, right? So if you're kowtowing to someone, right, you go before your superior, in particular like uh, the Emperor of China and stuff, right, and you get on both knees and your forehead touches the, the actual ground and stuff, right? So it's not even just bowing, it's like proper like prostrating yourself in front of uh, someone, right? And this is what the Chinese emperor expected all foreigners to do and stuff. Well, for, for anyone, anyone in the presence of the emperor had to kowtow. And, you know, Earl, like, McCartney was like, hold on, first of all, no, I'm not doing that, right? I wouldn't even do this for my own king. Like, why would I do it? it like, literally in, in England, no one would do this for anyone, right? Like, you know, bowing, like, curtsying, yeah, fine, general reflecting, whatever, but not kowtowing, right? We're not going to do that. And so, basically, you know, as a compromise, he was like, okay, how about this, yeah? I'll kowtow as long as there's a Chinese person who also kowtows to a, a painting of King George III. To which the Chinese just laughed, like, are you stupid? Like, like do you understand what you're even saying here? Like, this is the, the, the emperor of the, the, the Middle Kingdom, right? This is, you know, this is someone sent by heaven, right? And you're comparing the emperor of China with this King George III. Like, are you even saying no? So, as a result of this year, this ended up leading to a lot of tension, a lot of uh, cultural misunderstanding i believe eventually there ends up being the uh the the compromise that he would like genuflect so the same way that he would like do to uh to the to king george he ended up eventually doing that to the emperor this gives the first taste of like how like the the you know the east versus west and like the kind of clashes that we're about to see now so in 1839 this marks the beginning of the so-called century of humiliation which isn't exactly a century it goes on a little bit longer than a century but this is the term that the chinese have for the period which i'm about to describe right so between 1839 to 1949 which the ccp you know the chinese government uh, basically say this is like you know the century of humiliation because it ends when like the the ccp basically take control of china but before that in this time, uh, this is when the Europeans end up basically humiliating China in various different things. And the very beginning of this humiliation begins with the first opium war, right? So, you know, at the present day, we have a war on drugs. This was the first war for drugs, right? So basically, uh, you yeah, know, as we discussed in our, our last video when we talked about uh, the British in India, uh, so the British obviously controlled uh, large parts of India and stuff. And around this time, like, they was like, okay, right, we need to sell stuff to the Chinese in order to get tea, right? So tea was a massive, massive thing. Yeah, right? I believe uh, something along uh, the lines of about 10% of uh, British uh, government revenue came from the sale of tea, right? You know, and this is obviously why you had like the, the Boston Tea Party, etc, etc. It's kind of because this was a good source of revenue for like the British Treasury, right? So tea is very important. However, the only thing that the Chinese are going to use to buy this tea is silver. And the British were running low on silver, you know, as a result of like the mines in Latin America, you know, like all the different Latin American countries becoming independent. It becomes a little bit harder to get silver and they don't really have silver themselves, etc. So, you know, the only thing they can sell is silver and, you know, they're kind of going, OK, we need to find something else to, to buy this tea with. Right. So they decided, ah, Chinese people like smoking opium. Right. What if we in India because we've got lots of fields, we've got lots of like space for it, it's off its good soil, etc. What if we grow opium and then sell it to the Chinese? Ah, this is a really good idea. And so 
you know, it ends up being a lot cheaper and a lot like of a higher quality than uh, what they get in China for it, right? And so as a result, you know, lots of Chinese people end up like taking even more opium than they were before. You know, so the Chinese government basically goes, okay, a lot of our people are becoming opium addicts. We need to crack down on this, right? And this ends up just leading to like the British smuggling in and stuff, right? So what ends up happening though is that the Chinese emperor gets really, really, really like a hard line on it and he appoints a minister uh, with the express thing of cracking down on opium, not just on users, but also on the distributors of it, i.e. like the British who are selling it and stuff, right? So the Chinese only allowed one uh, port in the whole of uh, China to uh, like where like the, the Westerners uh, could trade from and this is uh, Canton, uh, which uh, today is Guangdong. You know, so we get the name like Canton from that, you know, Cantonese. We get it from the name of this city because it's been anglicized and stuff. But Canton, Guangdong, basically this is the only port from which uh, uh, Westerners can sell things to the Chinese, right? So the, the Chinese government ends up cracking down this, yeah, ends up arresting uh, some of the, the merchants who are there and stuff, right? And, you know, the person who's there, like the, the British Emissary and stuff, who's a representative of um, uh, the, the, the East India Company, he's like, okay, and try and find some sort of compromise, try and find some sort of uh, negotiation. And he tells the merchants there, we'll find compensation for you guys at some point, etc, etc. However, when news for this reaches London, the parliament there very narrowly ends up voting to go to war for drugs, right? Um, so they end up sending uh, like ironclad uh, 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 ships, right? So like these are like ironclad steam ships. So before this, like all kind of ships like, like have been uh, made out of wood. But as a result of like the industrial revolution, you had the first ships which were made out of iron, right? So uh, these ironclad uh, ships, like the, the most the notorious of which was called the Nemesis, basically this end up going to China and completely wiped out like uh, the, the Chinese junks that they had. So junks is the name for like, the, the, the Chinese ships that they had up there. And that's probably where the, the, the phrase piece of junk comes from. Um, but anyway, so they end up completely humiliating them there. And basically it was like, right, you're going to buy opium or us, yeah, right? You're gonna have free trade. We're forcing free trade on you, right? And so you have to allow your citizens, if they want our opium, to, to sell it, right? You know, it's basically supply and demand, but at the same time, you know, imagine if a country today was invaded or at least like attacked and stuff, yeah, because it refused to buy narcotics from someone else, right? Is yeah, that's kind of the best way to like think about it. And as a result, the Chinese end up protesting against this and there end up being a second opium war. Now, during the second opium war, this is when uh, the Russians end up taking advantage of this and they end up seizing a large parts of uh, what's now Siberia and then taking the port of uh, Vladivostok. So this is the first time, you know, the Treaty of, I can't pronounce that name, but um, yeah, that treaty is the first time that the Chinese ever officially recognised the existence of another country, right? So see, we tied that in very nicely. Now, as if it wasn't bad enough here that they were humiliated in these wars, on top of that, the Westerners enforced unequal treaties, right? So for instance, the reason why the British have Hong Kong, well, had Hong Kong, is as a result of one of these unequal treaties, right? So, you know, they end up taking like a, a control over it and basically like they forced on the Chinese, like that they had to allow uh, the free movement of, uh, of uh, merchants and stuff throughout the whole of China. Um, and yeah, so the Chinese, like whether they wanted to or not, had to buy things from the Westerners. It's not like they went and forced people to buy uh, like Western products, yeah, but it was a thing where the Chinese government had no jurisdiction on what like Westerners could or could not sell to the, their own citizens. So this is kind of what ended up happening during this time. And also as a result of this, you end up having a lot of Chinese people who are very resentful of this, yeah, a lot of like Chinese nationalists, especially amongst uh, the peasant class, right? So around the turn of the last century, you end up having what was set up as uh, the um, the fighting fists, or I can't remember the exact name of it, I've got it on screen now. Uh, but basically, these people end up being known by Westerners as the boxers, right? So these are Chinese nationalists, and basically their aim was to uh, basically kick out uh, Western influence, uh, to kick out like the, the, the Christian missionaries, uh, to, to kill uh, Chinese Christian converts and stuff. So that was basically their I aim, yeah, to, to like restore China, yeah, basically make China great again as such. Um, however, when they did this, yeah, so this is uh, the Boxer Rebellion is 1899 to 1901. When it happening is that it wasn't just the British or the French or the Russian, etc., etc. It was an eight nation army, yeah, which made up of Britain, France, Russia, Japan, uh, America, Germany, 
Italy and Austria-Hungary, right? So all these different people came together yeah, because also as well, something to note is that uh, the Boxer Rebellion is supported by the, the Empress Dowager. I can't remember how to pronounce her name. Sorry about that. Yeah, you know, like so, she was like more of a representative of the uh, conservative wing of like the, the the imperial court, and so she kind of was like, okay we're going to use these peasants uh, to basically kick the Westerners out of uh, China and stuff, right? Now, this ended up being really, really badly crushed. And in our own timeline, what ended up happening as a result of this rebellion is that the Chinese were forced to pay reparations to the Western governments, right? So from 1901 to 1939, the equivalent of, well, if you use like uh, 2010 uh, US dollars, right? Over that time of almost 40 years, $61 billion worth of silver ended up having to be paid to these eight nations, right? As compensation for what was lost uh, during this rebellion. But what if, what if, Instead of that, they had decided, right, what we're going to do is we're going to, in the same way we had the scramble for Africa, uh, a, a, like a decade or so before, we're going to have a scramble for China. So that's the premise of uh, this alternative history.